Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kim St. Martin, and I'm the Assistant Director for the My MTSS Technical Assistance Center. And I wanted to welcome everyone to the first of three sessions um, focusing on dyslexia. So this is the first session titled Understanding Dyslexia. And I wanted to introduce our presenters today. So I have, which you can see, Dr. Nancy Nelson. Uh, Dr. N Nelson is the co-lead of professional development for the National Center for Improving Li Literacy, NSIL. And the National Center on Improving Literacy has been really a collaborator with our Technical Assistance Center, focusing on intensifying literacy outcomes for students with se severe and uh, persistent reading needs. And they also come with a wide array of expertise in the area of dys dyslexia. So Dr. Nelson is a research assistant professor at the Center on Teaching and Learning at the University of Oregon, and is also the, the director of clinic and outreach services, which houses the CTL clinic. Dr. Nelson's research focuses on developing and evaluating math and reading interventions for students in kindergarten through grade eight. She's a nationally certified school psychologist and a former middle and high school special education math teacher. So welcome, Dr. Nelson. And I also have the gift of introducing everyone to our second presenter. Our second presenter is Brian Guerin. Hi, Brian, nice to see you. Um, Brian is, he's the co-lead for the dissemination strand for the Center for, at the National Center for Improving Literacy. And Brian's a doctoral student in educational methodology, policy and leadership, and a graduate employee at the University of Oregon Center on Teaching and Learning. He's a former high school social studies and English teacher at a priority school in Delaware. And Brian's research is broadly focused on the translation of scientific research to educational policy and practice. So it is a gift to have both uh, Nancy and Brian joining us today. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the two of you. Welcome. Great. Thank you, Kim. Um, good afternoon, everyone in, in Michigan. I appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today. I know it's late in your day, so uh, we'll try and make this valuable and um, worth your time. As Kim mentioned, we're talking about understanding dyslexia today. And so before we get started, I wanted to alert your attention to the COVID-19 resources survey uh, that my MTSS is putting out. So this QR code, if you uh, link to, or if you take a picture, you can click to the link or you can copy the, uh, the link from the, um, the slide itself. Um, and please consider taking this survey. Uh, which is focused on COVID-19 resources uh, that have been developed by my M MTSS and your, and your use of those. Very briefly, I wanna introduce the National Center on Improving Literacy for those of you who may not be familiar with it. Our mission uh, as a national center, a uh, federally funded national center by uh, authorized under the Every Student Succeeds Act, focused primarily on supporting students with or at risk for disabilities, including dyslexia in the area of literacy. Um, our, our focus is on increasing access uh, and use of evidence-based approaches for screening, identification, instruction, and intervention uh, for this target population. We have a broad team uh, that we're housed at the University of Oregon primarily, but we have partners at our RMC or Research Management Corporation and Florida State University. And we have five areas of focus, screening and identification, instruction and intervention, parent and family support, professional development and technical assistance, and then dissemination of our work. Our website uh, and uh, social media channels were referenced on our, our first slide of the, of the presentation. So we do encourage you to visit those links to get additional resources. So first, I'm gonna prompt uh, your background knowledge regarding dyslexia. And so there are five poll questions uh, that our colleagues at my MTSS are push pushing out to you. Um, I want you to go ahead and take a few minutes to answer uh, these, these poll questions. 
take about 30 more seconds to answer these questions. All right, so I'm sharing our poll results for you here. Uh, there, are the first here, I'm not going to I'm not going to go through the right answers, but I'm I'm reviewing your responses as we feed into the rest of our presentation. So the first question or statement was: There are no clues a child might be struggling with dyslexia before they complete their first years of schooling. The vast majority of those of you in attendance uh, believe that to be false. Dyslexia is diagnosable using a single test score. A high number of all of you believe that to be false. Dyslexia causes students to reverse letters. A moderate number of you believe that to be false. Students with dyslexia need instructional methods that are distinct from other students struggling to learn to read. That was about 50-50 in the audience. And then individuals with dyslexia experience the same level of difficulty learning to read. And the, the vast majority of you, again, believe those to be false. So thank you for answering those questions. That was intended to sort of prompt your background knowledge. Um, we will address all of those uh, topics today in our session, along with some other, uh, other topics. Specifically, uh, by the end of this session, we expect that you'll be able to define dyslexia as a descriptor of a reading disorder characterized by word level reading disabilities originating with phonological processing weaknesses. Describe the range of students who are estimated to be affected by dyslexia. So what is the prevalence of dyslexia and how does that vary? Identify the range of dyslexia characteristics that students may exhibit. Discern dyslexia facts from common dyslexia myths. Discuss the challenges with learning to read and spell and understand how states are enacting legislation and policy to improve reading outcomes for students with dyslexia. So getting started, uh, just defining dyslexia. And I wanna thank, uh, thank Don Compton uh, at Florida State University for his contributions to these slides as a collaborator for the National Center on Improving Literacy. So what is dyslexia? Well, broadly, this definition uh, is our NICHD definition or shortened form NIH definition of dyslexia. And I am going to take the time to read it because there are some key terms that I'm going to uh, mention in our, our next few slides. So dyslexia is a specific learning disability that is neurobiological in origin. It's characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition and by poor spelling and decoding abilities. These difficulties typically result from a deficit in the phonological component of language that is often unexpected in relation to other cognitive abilities and the provision of effective classroom instruction. Secondary consequences may include problems in reading comprehension and reduced reading experience that can impede growth of vocabulary and background knowledge. So there are multiple things going on here when we're talking about dyslexia. So hovering here, we're talking about this being a specific learning disability that is neurobiological in origin. Origin, And so we're saying that this is a disability. Um, it's per in particular, it's a specific learning disability, which is one of our 13 federally recognized categories of disability under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And that it's neurobiological in origin, meaning there's a brain basis for uh, this disorder. What causes dyslexia typically uh, is a deficit in the phonological component of language. And so we, we understand that these students are students who struggle with skills then that are related to this deficit in the phonological component of language. In particular, when we're considering the neurological basis of dyslexia, uh, we know that there are multiple areas of the brain that contribute to effective and efficient reading. And so we see those areas activated with typical readers. For students with dyslexia or students struggling uh, with these reading skills, we typically see activation in the frontal lobe and much more isolation of the activation. And so we see different brain activation and patterns um, for, these, for these different groups. Because of the way uh, that reading develops in the brain and what we see of uh, these based on the activation patterns, we know now that the brain is hardwired to learn language and that exposure to language 
is in almost all cases what we need to learn language. That's not true for reading. And so reading is not a natural skill. It's not something that we were necessarily um, built to be able to do uh, at birth. And so it's something that we have to, to learn, which means we have to be actively taught to read. And so we're, we're really looking at some rewiring of the brain in order to support the ability to read effectively and efficiently. Characteristics of dyslexia in particular uh, are probably familiar to many of you based on your experience working with students with dyslexia, but we see students with dyslexia having difficulties with accurate or fluent word recognition, poor spelling, and poor decoding. And then secondary consequences. So the, the uh, fluent word recognition, poor spelling, poor decoding, those are all primary attributes of what we see for dyslexia. Secondary consequences based on those primary difficulties are problems that include difficulties in reading comprehension and vocabulary based in large part on students' lack of exposure to text over time. So we're gonna pause and reflect again for about two minutes here. So how is this definition of dyslexia similar or different from your prior understanding? And ideally we would be able to put you in breakout rooms so that you can engage in discussion with your peers. Uh, alas, the pandemic has made some of these things much more challenging. And so I want you to just take a moment and reflect on your own. How is this definition of dyslexia, this NICHD definition or NIH definition, similar or different from your prior understanding? Take about 20 more seconds to wrap up any thoughts you have. <clears throat> All right, we're gonna transition into uh, myths and misconceptions related to dyslexia. So these are myths. Um, with crediting Louisa Motes for, uh, for acknowledging some of these myths and misconceptions that are prevalent uh, in the field. So there's a misconception that dyslexia is a gift. Uh, it's not a gift the same way that any other disability might not be a gift. There are difficulties associated with dys dyslexia and any uh, benefit uh, is derived from other hard work and not from dyslexia itself. Another common myth is that Albert, Ice, Albert Einstein was dyslexic. In fact, he was not. Also, we cannot predict who will respond to instruction. <clears throat> we, we cannot, in, in fact, um, predict who will respond to instruction, which is why we need to provide highly effective instruction as part of addressing uh, the difficulties that students with dyslexia or who are at risk for dyslexia may have. Phonological processing instruction is not enough. So we can't just teach students phonological processing. We need to teach more broadly than that in order to address the difficulties associated with dyslexia. And probably um, equal, well, equally important, quick fixes don't work. And so this is something that takes time. It takes effort. It takes a big focus on 
evidence-based practices to address these needs. Another myth that we want to dispel, uh, dyslexia is an all or none, none condition or an all or nothing condition. Either you have it or you don't, which is to say that dyslexia is diagnosable with a single test score. In our uh, poll, you all, for the most part, were spot on with uh, understanding that that is a myth. In fact, dyslexia uh, identification involves a complex diagnosis and relies on data from multiple sources and professional judgment. So using evidence from assessments, educational opportunity, the use of scientifically based reading instruction and intervention is used to identify dyslexia uh, using common approaches and methods that we have for that process now. Uh, that's consistent with the definition uh, requiring that uh, it's, dyslexia is not uh, the result of, uh, you have to look at dyslexia in the face of scientifically delivered uh, reading instruction. And so we're dispelling this, this myth that you can use a single test score, um, that you can say either you have dyslexia or you don't. It's not, it's not that clear cut. And there are some other aspects of this related to the prevalence of dyslexia that Brian will discuss a bit later this afternoon. Another myth, there are no clues to dyslexia before children complete the first years of schooling. Um, we know in fact that there are some predictors that are highly, uh, some risk factors that are highly associated with dyslexia. These are correlational risk factors, but they're things that can alert us to the fact that there may be a potential problem so that we can screen for that problem early on. So we know that reading, even though reading is not the same as spoken language in terms of its acquisition, we know that reading stems from spoken language as one aspect of how it's developed and individuals with dyslexia may have delays in speech or recognizing words that rhyme. Family history may also be associated with dyslexia. And so there are early clues that tell us or alert us to the possibility um, that we should be at least on alert for dyslexia. Another myth here is that individuals with dyslexia have the same level of condition severity and experience the same level of difficulty learning to read. This is another one that uh, you all were pretty spot on in identifying. Um, we know that that severity ranges dramatically. So many individuals, some that have dyslexia, some that don't experience difficulties learning to read. Individuals with dyslexia also differ in severity. Um, so within the population of dyslexia from milder forms to more severe forms and the severity of uh, dyslexia experienced is related to the severity of difficulty learning to read. So for students that do have severe difficulties learning to read, those are individuals that are likely to have more severe forms of dyslexia. What does that look like? Uh, let's, it's a bit of a continuum. I'm gonna try and move my, I, I wanna see people here, but I'm gonna try and move this out of the way so that you can see my slide. Um, so on this continuum from less severe to more severe, uh, we see students with less severe dyslexia or individuals with less severe dyslexia have difficulties in word level reading, which is the primary underlying problem. That's true regardless of severity. We see students with less severe uh, dyslexia have difficulties that are not exacerbated by other issues uh, such as cognitive processes or attention. We also see that students with less severe dyslexia um, have no problems with comprehension and vocabulary, or um, at least those are areas that are minimally affected by their dyslexia. For students with more severe forms of dyslexia, again, as I mentioned, uh, those difficulties in word level reading are the primary underlying problem. Um, the difficulties are exacerbated by cognitive processes like processing speed, working memory, and also attention that are likely to be uh, comorbid with dyslexia. It's pronounced in more severe forms of dyslexia. And then also uh, the, there are these secondary problems in reading comprehension and vocabulary are likely occur, which makes addressing the reading difficulties more complicated, particularly the longer we wait in intervening to support students. Uh, those problems grow dramatically over time as students are expected to know and do more in reading. <clears throat> Another myth is that dyslexia is a reading disorder based on vision problems, which causes people to see letters backward or mix up letters like B and D. Um, so again, dyslexia is a brain-based disorder and there are impairments in uh, regions of the brain associated with speech sounds, but dyslexia is not a vision problem. And so 
it's not a visual perception difficulty. It's not something um, that causes these letter reversals. And so that's, that's not a warning sign nor a symptom of dyslexia. So I'm going to um, navigate to this, this video here. I have uploaded it on my computer to hopefully make the, your ability to hear the video and see the video easily. I'm gonna, this video is a, a few minutes long, but I'm going to put some cushion around this in case you need to pause um, and go to your own website using this link in order to watch the video. made dyslexia difficult to study is that even though it's primarily uh, a reading difficulty and that's how people recognize it as difficulty with reading single words because of the struggles with decoding those words um, the manifestations of dyslexia have been described to be quite varied uh, people have talked about uh, not just difficulties in reading but differences in motor performance and visual tasks and so on and so people have often wondered why are there these different behavioral manifestations and some of these uh, could be um, part of dyslexia even though they're not causing the reading difficulties and some of them may be the consequence of not learning to read and and that's also where brain imaging is, is helpful as a tool to begin to help um, arbitrate between different theoretical frameworks and uh, um, we have found, for example, that the visual system in some areas that aren't directly involved in reading are also altered, but it's, uh, it's, that's not the part that's contributing to the reading problem, but it seems to change as a function of whether we're skilled readers or not. And it may have something to do with the fact that as uh, humans, uh, we learn to read. It's a, it's a uniquely human skill. Uh, it requires some some combination of things that we do, as including a lot of eye movement and very carefully controlled saccadic eye movement across the letters as we scan them. And that's not necessarily how our brain was expecting us to go about leading, leading our daily life. And so it's, it's uh, not unexpected that when we look at typical readers, we see uh, what we see as a typical person is really a person whose brain has changed in response to having undergone years of learning how to read and those that's how the brain has become organized and so for people who don't read as much because of their dyslexia we may not see some of those systems um, the way we see in typical readers and we have to be careful how to interpret them is it the dyslexia that's causing that or is it a consequence of not reading as much So taking a minute here, just in case others are catching up um, from viewing this independently. Okay, and so that was Dr. Guinevere Eden from Georgetown University, who's an expert uh, in dyslexia and dyslexia identification. And in her video, she describes the utility of brain imaging and how activity in the brain differs between skilled readers and those with dyslexia. So I want you to take a minute, take about two minutes to consider what are the implications of the lack of causal relationship between reading and the brain activity for screening identification and intervention. And when I say the lack of causal relationship, I mean, based on the video and based on Dr. Eden's expertise, she acknowledges that brain, uh, brain functioning doesn't necessarily cause the reading difficulties and reading difficulties don't necessarily cause brain dysfunction. We see that they're correlated. We know that there's, there's a brain impact, uh, but we don't know which direction that relationship flows. And so given that, what is the, what is the impact of that lack of causal relationship for screening, identification, and intervention, um, particular for students with, dysle with dyslexia. So consider for two minutes on that question. <laughs> 
<clears throat> we're wrapping up. Some key takeaways that I have from that video are one, um, that screening using brain imaging is not cost effective. We know that um, it's expensive uh, independently to conduct uh, the, the kinds of brain imaging tests that are required to do the mapping to look at brain activity. They're also screening using brain imaging is also unnecessary. So in a school-based context, we can rely on student performance data to assess risk by measuring the observable, observable behavior uh, that students are expected to demonstrate in order to be able to read and, and measure the behavior related to the factors that are associated with dyslexia. Another key takeaway I have from that video is that beyond the sort of limited cost effectiveness of brain imaging, we can't actually use brain Im imaging in the absence of other data to diagnose dyslexia. And so because this pattern is correlational, we can't look at a uh, brain imaging um, document and say that that is evidence of dyslexia, even though uh, it, it may be an example of dyslexia, but we don't know that for sure. We need other data to support uh, that type of decision. And then last, uh, brain imaging tells us nothing about the specific skills students are struggling with in, in reading words, whereas reading performance data do. So in a school-based context, we want to have data that are actionable to support our instruction and intervention so that we can treat this, these issues associated with dyslexia. And so um, we're in a good position then where uh, it's certainly not feasible to conduct brain imaging in schools that we have other tools that provide uh, useful data for us in this kind of framework of supporting students with dyslexia. With that in mind and transitioning to thinking about those, those skills, um, I wanna review the simple view of reading, which is a way of thinking about um, reading in terms of how it develops and the dependence between the skills that contribute to becoming proficient readers. So the simple view um, presented by Gao and Tunmer in 1986 is this product of decoding and language comprehension, which results in reading comprehension. So decoding includes uh, these word recognition skills that are sort of the hallmark of dyslexia that are based on phonological awareness, uh, decoding and spelling uh, skill, sight recognition of words, and then language comprehension, uh, which is a combination of background knowledge, vocabulary knowledge, language structures, verbal reasoning, and literacy knowledge. And these two together are what define uh, skilled reading and their students' ability to read text independently and comprehend or understand what it is that they're reading. So if a student has decoding skills, strong decoding skills, um, but poor comprehension skills, mathematically, uh, they're not going to be very good readers. Um, vice versa, also true. So poor decoding skills, but good language comprehension skills, we also wouldn't expect those children to become good readers. And so we need to address uh, those contributing factors in order to support uh, overall goal of uh, reading comprehension and skilled reading. So when we, when we look at um, the subtyping of read pro problems, we can, we can look at this sort of two-way table um, where there's four different cells that are the, you know, the combination of different skills in each of these areas. And so, and when we're talking about language comprehension skills on the top and decoding skills on the left, we have cells for poor and good with respect to each of those types of skills. And we look at the interactions of, of what that looks like. So typical readers are those that have good decoding skills and good language comprehension skills, consistent with the simple view of reading. Poor readers uh, are those who have poor decoding skill and poor language comprehension skills. So essentially they don't have either of the primary tools that are necessary for skilled reading. And that's sort of what we would, we would call sort of your garden variety poor reader, right? When we look at uh, students that have good decoding skills, we, can, we have those that have poor uh, language comprehension skills. And those are generally students that have specific comprehension deficits. And so, so those are not our children with dyslexia, but they're, they're readers who are struggling for other reasons. They do not represent the majority of struggling readers, but they are a population that should be considered broadly as we're thinking about how to address reading difficulties in school settings. <clears throat> 
we then again have our, our typical readers that have good decoding skills and good uh, language comprehension skills. Then we have our children that have good uh, comprehension skills. Um, so those students are typically our, our typical readers, right? The ones that have good decoding skills and good language comprehension skills. Or we have our population of students that have poor decoding skills and good language comprehension skills, which are our students with dyslexia. And certainly for today, that's uh, the focus of the presentation, but it's worth considering how all of these different groups are present and what that looks like in the context of school setting. So when we consider the definition of dyslexia for identification, uh, there are several problems. Uh, we've named some of them, um, but another primary dilemma is that almost all children with dyslexia have phonological processing problems that disrupt their learning to read. But similar to what we see with sort of the, um, the brain difficulty paradigm, not all children with phonological processing problems have dyslexia. So how can we reconcile this? <clears throat> we rely on uh, different theories that support our understanding of dyslexia and how we treat dyslexia in school settings. So uh, there's a single versus multiple deficit account of dyslexia, uh, which is to say that even though we know phonological processing is a core deficit, it's insufficient in and of itself to explain dyslexia and its, and its origins. Um, the etiology of dyslexia, and like all behavioral disorders and how it has evolved, is complex and involves multiple components. And so we know that there are multiple interacting risk and protective factors that we want to consider when we're thinking about how to screen and identify students primarily for dyslexia. So the constructs that we know that are most consistently implicated in dyslexia include phonological awareness, awareness rapid serial naming, verbal short-term memory, vocabulary and other aspects of broader oral language skill and graphomotor processing speed. Um, and importantly, particularly when we, when we start talking about screening in school settings and screening for skills that are appropriate to screen for in school settings, we need to know that broadly the most powerful pre predictor of dyslexia varies with a student's developmental age or stage. So rapid naming might be very predictive in early elementary school, but less predictive later on. Similarly, phonological awareness and measures of phonological awareness might be more predictive early on, but largely taper off over time because students either know those skills or they're not the, the focus of how, they're, of how they're learning to read and how they're interacting with text. And so they, they're, they be, their prediction uh, reduces over time. In this multiple risk model um, posited by Pennington, family history, uh, ADHD or attention difficulties, and executive functioning along with social skills are all uh, constructs that are associated with dyslexia. So that's to say that in this sort of constellation model, there are factors other than phonological awareness uh, that have validity in predicting differences between students uh, in their outcomes or in, in their dyslexia presence. Um, and that the majority of cases of dyslexia will involve multiple values or multiple predictors. Um, and all to say that there are generally multiple risk factors that are present when we start thinking about dyslexia, which complicates um, some of the, the identification, complicates diagnosis, um, but uh, allows us to think more broadly about dyslexia as a whole. Another factor that has been mentioned related to uh, dyslexia potentially is socioeconomic status. And so we do see that there is a correlation between lower socioeconomic status and poor word reading or poor comprehension. Um, we see that larger and poor comprehension, particularly at the older ages. Um, when we delve a little bit deeper into this, um, the we see that the variance in outcomes is actually um, not explained by SES and it is predominantly explained by reading, and reading skills. So even though we know that many children from disadvantaged backgrounds are struggling in reading, um, that that is a result of their SES is, um, is not accurate. There are other factors um, that contribute to those difficulties, including child, uh, family, neighborhood, school, and community characteristics 
um, that feed into whether or not a child is uh, able to read and whether that child may have dyslexia. Additionally, as we move across sort of culture and consider the role of English as a, as a particular language and learning to read, we see that there are similarities between English and other languages, and particularly other alphabetic languages, but that uh, relationship persists across different types of languages um, where uh, students have these difficulties in phonological awareness uh, and, and that's the main predictor of their reading difficulties. Um, even in Chinese, uh, where um, it's a logographic language uh, and the smallest written uh, units in the language represent morphemes, um, we still see that phonology is, is relevant to uh, reading in Chinese and plays a role. And so uh, the, there's a consistency across languages and learning to read in this pattern of word level reading difficulties being the primary issue um, contributing to uh, dyslexia and difficulty uh, learning to read. For the National Center on Improving Literacy and uh, largely um, a good portion of the field, word level reading disability is, is how we think about what dyslexia is. And so we, we would say that dyslexia is synonymous with that terminology, word level reading disability. And note that word, students that have word level reading disabilities have difficulty uh, with, uh, um, with the awareness and ability to manipulate the sound structure of language, otherwise known as phonological awareness, and also difficulty uh, with the ability to map the, the sound structure of language onto print and blend those sounds to read words, which is alphabetic principle and, and phonemic recoding, respectively. Uh, word level reading disability, as we've identified, um, based and consistent uh, with a simple view of reading, word level reading difficulties can cause a host of ancillary difficulties, including difficulties with uh, reading connected text fluently, comprehension and vocabulary development that all contribute to the ability to understand uh, and read text independently. And as Kim mentioned, there are uh, several other sessions in this series. I don't want to jump the gun and get too far ahead, um, but I do wanna give you a preview of what is coming based on the definition of dyslexia and the, the myths that we've talked about today. So the first, uh, as we, as we th think about um, dyslexia in school systems is that multi-tiered systems of support, including response to intervention uh, is used to determine whether or not a student needs special education as a result of a reading disability. And that's not um, ag agnostic of dyslexia. Dyslexia is included in that approach. So your multi-tiered systems of support and response to intervention are very important for how you, how you think about uh, ensuring that students are getting access to the supports that they need and going through the identification process that schools will use for dyslexia. Another preview point is that particularly in elementary school, uh, we can screen for dyslexia using the same or similar tools that we use to screen for general reading risk. So the reason for that is um, probably twofold. And so the first, is that the vast majority of struggling readers struggle with word level reading difficulties. Um, so with word level reading skills, which is a hallmark of dyslexia. And so that's not to say all students who are struggling early on have dyslexia, but the, that most students when they're learning to read will struggle with that skill first and foremost. The other part of that is that, um, I know Kim, it looks like Kim has a question. So I'll, I'm gonna let her jump in in just a second. Let me say this one thing, Kim. <laughs> the other part of that is that these screening assessments in order to be used for screening for dyslexia need to address all of the skills that we know are relevant to dyslexia. So there's an assumption here that your screening systems that you're using in schools are addressing these skills that are risk factors associated with dyslexia like phonological awareness, phonics, fluency, et cetera. Kim. Nancy, we have a question from one of yeah. our participants. Great. Perfect. Um, we are differentiating dyslexia from other forms of poor word level reading difficulties that have, uh, excuse me, other uh, etiologies outside of poor phonological processing slash language development, correct? So let me start right there. Is that correct? 
Uh, is it is it correct that we're distinguishing other types of readers, students with dyslexia from other uh, students with other reading difficulties? Poor, yes, poor. Uh, so differentiating dyslexia from other forms of poor word level reading difficulties that have other uh, etiologies outside of poor phonological processing slash language mm -hmm. development. I have multiple answers to that question. So in a true diagnostic sense, outside of the school setting, yes, you have to be able to, uh, to have rule outs and distinguish that a child has dyslexia relative to another type of difficulty, right? In a school-based setting where we're most concerned with appropriate instruction and intervention to address the deficits that this, the, children, the child is demonstrating, there's less concern about pinpointing the particular etiology or pattern or type of reader a student is and more focus on determining uh, the type of instruction and intervention that the child needs in order to be an effective reader. Thank you. Yeah, great. Any other questions, Kim, that I should address uh, right now? Nope, not yet. Okay. <clears throat> Another uh, just sort of preview towards screen and identification is this notion that uh, diagnostic assessment uh, is used, how, how I guess the, the, the distinction is how diagnostic assessment is used in school settings. And so there's a little bit of a misconception that all ch children who are struggling and reading need diagnostic assessment in order to determine where to focus for instruction and intervention. And that is not the case, particularly in early elementary school, where we know very well the skills that students need to know in order to be proficient readers. We know very well how to teach those students those skills. And the gaps between students are relatively narrow early on. And so we know that we need to focus on these skills of phonemic awareness, phonics, and accurate and fluent reading, in addition to vocabulary and comprehension but we need to focus on these early skills early on. And so diagnostic assessment serves to uh, figure out where the holes are that a student has, or it serves to identify a starting point for instruction. And early on there aren't holes and we don't need a starting point for instruction because we know what to do. And so um, I, as we think about efficient assessment, I, I um, encourage uh, practitioners to think about the role of diagnostic assessment and when it's actually necessary. Um, for serving students. Another preview related to instruction and intervention um, is this notion of what, what do we do when we, we know a student has reading risk. Um, they may have general reading risk. They may have risk related to dyslexia uh, specifically. And we know um, based on prevalence data and other studies that have been conducted over time that uh, roughly 40% of students will learn to read regardless of the method used to teach reading. Okay, so 40% of kids will learn no matter what it is that what you're doing in the classroom. So sort of you could say that developmentally, they'll learn to read. But that means that 60% of students will not. So 60% of our kindergarten, first, second graders, and so on will not learn to read without deliberate instruction that's proven effective for teaching reading. As that means in the area of instruction and intervention that we need to use explicit systematic reading instruction and that's necessary to teach students to read. Uh, we should use it across context. So in general education and special education uh, in our intervention classrooms as well as our sort of core instruction classrooms. Uh, and that all students can benefit from this teaching method. So uh, even though it's targeting the 60% of students that uh, will not learn to read without it, the other 40% of students will uh, continue to learn to read just fine with explicit systematic instruction, and so it's necessary. Another preview toward content that you'll get on instruction and intervention in a later uh, session is that effective interventions um, target word level reading skills and should be available to students with reading difficulties. In this case, I'm talking about dyslexia specifically or students at risk for dyslexia specifically early on as a method of prevention and continuing as long as they are needed to support access to the curriculum and remediate skill deficits. So that's to say that early on in elementary school, but for students that demonstrate risk for dyslexia across time, they need access to interventions that are focused on word level reading skills. They should be provided early to prevent reading gaps from growing and that those interventions should be provided as long as is necessary um, to ensure that they're able to, to meet appropriate standards 
So those interventions could be provided in the context of general education or in the context of special education, and that's largely dependent on the resources that are required to sustain the intervention over time. Yes. Nancy, we have another question. This Great. is a common one. In our area recently, had, we had a pediatric eye doctor diagnosed dyslexia based on eye movement testings. Uh -huh. Would you comment more on vision tracking and dyslexia? Yeah, I, um, there's the, the jury is sort of out, I would say, on whether or not uh, eye tracking would be um, an appropriate method for identifying or diagnosing a student for dyslexia. Um, based on my knowledge of the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, I'm not a licensed psychologist or medical professional, and so I cannot make uh, major judgments about that. But my, uh, my understanding is that would not be an appropriate approach, particularly in a school-based context where we're thinking again about instruction and intervention and how we target the needs of that, of that student. So we, we do see in school settings quite frequently that uh, medical professionals in particular will identify a student as having dyslexia uh, without respect to the educational environment. And um, many of those students, Brian will speak to this a little bit, but many of these those students are still served in schools under the, the fact that they have a disability, but they may not be served in special education. So a student coming in with an outside diagnosis would still in a school-based context need to demonstrate a need for specialized instruction in order to get access to special education services. If the student is demonstrating difficulties or risk in their reading skills, in addition to the visual difficulties, visual tracking difficulties that uh, the pediatrician identified, then that child should get intervention to target the reading difficulties. Um, we know that there's not a, a lot of efficacy for providing uh, interventions that target visual skills uh, in terms of translation to reading difficulties or translation to reading improvements. So we want to focus more um, proximally on the skills that are difficult as the way we intervene and then also observe outcomes. Thank you. Yeah, Nancy, if I can just add to that. Um, so I, I'm pretty interested in eye tracking research and I, I agree with everything Nancy just said. Um, I'm skeptical that we'll ever as a field rely on eye tracking in order to make diagnostic decisions because as Nancy was kind of getting at, eye tracking data doesn't get at any of the inclusionary or exclusionary criteria in most common definitions of dyslexia. That's not to say it isn't useful. Um, you can tell a surprising lot about um, what might be going on in a student's mind based on where their eyes are and pupil dilation and these sorts of things. Uh, and there have been some pilot tests on the um, classification accuracy of eye tracking uh, devices. So I, what I expect to happen is as eye tracking technology becomes cheaper, uh, you might see this get merged with other types of assessment because uh, cameras are all over the place now. And so it's not that hard to get that. It's becoming increasingly more cost effective to get that data, but I don't think it's ever going to replace uh, the behavioral measures that uh, we're currently using. That's great, Brian. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to point out one other thing just related to this uh, sort of preview of instruction or intervention, and then I'll wrap up and uh, hand it over to Brian. Um, but this, I, I find it very fascinating that when we look at uh, national achievement data and even local achievement data, uh, we see that roughly two thirds, sorry, roughly uh, two fifths, <laughs> that would be a different percentage of our fourth grade students are proficient readers, which is about 40%. And so that what that tells me when I hear um, those achievement data is that essentially our instruction intervention in schools is largely catering to students that will learn to read regardless of the instructional method that they're using. And so we're not doing enough to provide the instruction intervention that is highly that we know is highly effective to teach struggling readers, including students with dyslexia. I'll also point out, just going to address uh, another another myth or one of the topics that you were polled about early on, is that uh, explicit and systematic instruction um, requires the use of modeling and demonstration. It requires frequent practice opportunities for students with feedback from instructors um, in order to support students to ultimately 
build toward mastery with decoding. And so we wanna teach skill student, we wanna make conspicuous the strategies that we're using to access text and share that with students. And that's, that's largely, you know, irrespective of dyslexia, that should be true across all five, five big ideas of instruction. So we can use explicit and systematic instruction to teach phonemic awareness and decoding and accurate and fluent reading with connected text and vocabulary and comprehension. When we're talking about students with dyslexia, we're focused on those foundational skills, right? So we're focused on phonemic awareness, decoding, some encoding as part of that, some um, fluent and accurate reading with connected text. But the methods that we use to teach those skills to students, whether they have dyslexia or whether they have a sort of garden variety reading difficulty that includes decoding difficulties are the same. So it's explicit and systematic instruction for all. Um, there's some misnomer that uh, multisensory instruction is required at, to teach students with dyslexia, and that is false. It could be that multisensory instruction is good, but there's no evidence to suggest that multisensory instruction is better or adds any value to teaching students explicitly and systematically in reading. And so I want to make sure that that point is made. Nancy, we've we've had a couple, a few questions come in around diagnostic assessments. Okay. So first one, how are you defining diagnostic assessments? Let's start with that one. How are you yeah. defining diagnostic mm -hmm. assessments? So I define diagnostic assessments in, in two ways. And so diagnostic assessments uh, can be used for um, diagnosis or sort of identification of a condition, which is which largely happens outside of the school setting. And I could talk more about that if folks want me to. Um, but most commonly in school settings, we talk about diagnostic assessments as supporting decision, supporting the collection of data to support decisions about the instruction, the specific instruction intervention students need. So uh, it's to identify, it's to sample very broadly all of the content that's necessary for a student to learn within a particular domain so that you know very well that the student has difficulties in, um, in a particular area within that domain to aid effective instructional planning and inform the interventions that a student student might be receiving. The follow-up question is that um, there is a continuum of informal decoding assessments to more standardized, oh, sorry, decoding, it's diagnost diagnostic assessments, uh -huh. to more standardized diagnostic assessments. As a school psychologist, what is considered the standard battery for diagnosis of dyslexia in a school setting? <clears throat> so this gets to the, the, the piece that I was um, maybe not going to talk about, but will, <laughs> um, which is that as a school psychologist, in fact, we don't uh, diagnose a condition, right, in a school setting. And so when we're talking about dyslexia, we're determining whether or not a child is demonstrating difficulties that are consistent with um, and um, informed by uh, the special education law that guides our eligibility decision making. And so we're identifying whether or not a child meets criteria for special education, but we're not, diagno not diagnosing whether or not the child has the condition that provides them access to special education through that eligibility decision making paradigm. So diagnosis in the sense of diagnosing a condition um, based on the way that our, um, our system is set up, our school system, but also our medical and clinical system, does not afford us the right or the ability in school settings to diagnose conditions. We diagnose, we identify, um, we identify conditions for eligibility decision making purely. I think there was another part of that question, Kim, that I missed. Yeah, and, um, well, the other part of it was from a school psychologist, what would be used to diagnose? Uh, right. Right, so in a school-based context, and uh, Brian will talk about what is, what's happening largely across uh, the US with respect to this, um, but as, in a school-based context, we're typically screening for dyslexia using our sort of response to intervention approach or multi-tiered systems approach. We're screening students for risk. We're ensuring that they get high quality instruction and intervention if they have risk. Um, we monitor their response to that risk. And if they're not responding, and or the, the child is you know, maybe in fourth or fifth grade, maybe older, um, maybe very, very, very far behind their peers. And we do need instructional diagnostic assessment to determine a starting point for instruction. 
we use those kinds of assessments to determine how we're going to instruct and intervene with students. And then we look at, again, response data over time in the face of instruction or intervention that's matched to their skill needs. If those students are not responding and are demonstrating a, a consistency with the eligibility criteria based on uh, IDEA, then a special education team can determine that the child is eligible for special education. So the types of assessments that you're using um, early on, again, screening, you're screening for um, the areas that Brian will talk, I don't want to, don't want to be redundant, screening for the areas that Brian will sort of alert you to, um, some of those that I've talked about all, already uh, in the presentation, and then you're diagnosing, diagnosing the instructional need um, based on uh, the domains of reading that we know are important for readers. So for dyslexia, for students that were, have a perception of dyslexia, we're really focused on these word level reading skills as informing the screening and diagnostic assessments that we use. One small follow-up question is an example of an informal diagnostic assessment and yep. informal decoding inventory. Uh -huh. Um, right. Yeah. So there are there are informal. So you can um, you can get very um, fine grained with all of this, right? So you know, if you take a step back, what I just went through and described makes sense. If you think about the day to day in a teacher's classroom, teachers are always using sort of fine grained, informal, quote unquote, diagnostic assessments to inform their instruction, and that's appropriate, right? That's that's different than pulling a child out of class and sitting them down for 30 to 60 to 90 minutes of tests to figure out a starting point for instruction compared to a check for understanding that a teacher is doing informally or a, a checkout to assess sort of mastery of content to inform the instruction moving forward. So those informal checks that are brief, they're uh, time limited, um, they're very instructionally relevant are appropriate. But when we're talking about additional diagnostic assessment that's going to be sort of mandated or in a standardized sense where we're, we're taking a student away from instructional time for an extended period, those would not be appropriate um, in the absence of data demonstrating that that child needs a comprehensive, more comprehensive diagnostic assessment to determine a starting point for instruction. Okay, we have two final questions. Great. This next one is, what are your thoughts on Orton-Gillingham instruction? I, I mean, Orton-Gillingham instruction is um, largely uses structured literacy as an approach. And so it, it's you know, consistent with um, the International Dyslexia Associ Association and how they've identified and described structured literacy. It includes all of the elements of teaching students explicitly and, explicitly and systematically. There are other components of that, like multi-sensory components that are embedded within um, those instructional within the instructional program, and that may or may not be useful. We, we, the jury is out on that component. And so I'm not suggesting that Orton-Gillingham isn't effective. I'm just suggesting potentially that it's not more effective than other programs that use explicit and systematic instruction and have been demonstrated to work for teaching kids how to read. Perfect. And um, one more question before we delve into Brian's uh, section. In what ways have you seen speech and language pathologists support students with dyslexia? Interesting. I may need Brian's help for, for that piece. Um, you know, I think that there is some overlap uh, in the two, but I've, I've largely seen in current trends, school psychologists being more involved in carrying, um, supporting school systems to carry out a lot of the, the procedures and processes associated with um, legislation that's coming down and requirements. So I mean, many, a lot of this is really falling to uh, general education and special education teachers. I think special education teachers are the ones that feel probably the brunt of most of this uh, because people are turning to them as the experts in figuring this out. Um, but school-based school speech language pathologists could uh, play a role based on their expertise. Brian, do you have thoughts? Yeah, that's my sense as well. Um, you know, the other thing I'll point out is that as technical assistance providers, we don't really get to see as much of the implementation as we would like. We see the policies and can provide technical assistance based on our experience and research. But so often when it comes to policy implementation, we just don't have that data about you know, what does instruction typically look like? You know, who's actually doing 
the day to day of writing these things, um, these things tend to not be well documented. Um, and so that's always sort of the black box for researchers. So uh, there may be more going on there, but I, I agree with Nancy that in terms of what the policies are calling for, it seems very targeted towards um, tier, tier one and tier two. So probably general educators and special educators and reading specialists. Thank you. Great, well, again, last slide, sort of um, just pausing and providing time for reflection here. And so this is sort of just in, in summary, uh, we know that multiple deficits or risk factors are associated with dyslexia, which makes screening and identification difficult. We also uh, have a, a context that's national uh, in that school systems use multi-tiered systems of support as a service delivery model, and that's very predominant. And that's consistent with the use of response to intervention for determining access to special programs. Explicit systematic instruction, but not necessarily multi-sensory instruction is necessary to teach students to read. So I want you to pause and reflect for the third time on the content presented thus far and write down uh, for yourself one to two new learnings from the sessions. So what will you take away based on the content presented so far and tell, tell others that you're working with uh, about dyslexia? So take two minutes for that before I hand it over to Brian for his, his portion of the content. Okay, great. So we're gonna stop there. Um, I'm gonna see if there are any questions, Kim, that we wanna address now, or if we wanna uh, hold on questions, more questions till the end. We're, we're caught up on questions. I know that we have another question that Brian, you're gonna to touch on in your, in your portion. So I think we're good. Okay, great. So uh, Brian, I'm gonna stop sharing and pass okay. allow you to share. Do you have, do you have slides? I should have checked. Yes, I do. Yeah. All right, <laughs> great, thanks. Okay, is that displaying well for everybody? Okay. We can see your uh, your notes though, that's the only. Oh, let's see. How's that? That's great. Okay. Yeah, so thanks, Nancy. Uh, so in my talk, I'm going to provide an overview of trends in national dyslexia policy. And in providing this overview, I'm hoping to reinforce two of our objectives for today. So defining dyslexia as a descriptor of a reading disorder characterized by word level reading disabilities originating with phonological process and weakness and describing the range of students who are estimated to be affected by dyslexia. And then sort of informally, I'm hoping to help you think through some of the steps that are involved in implementing policy in part by looking at all the different approaches states have taken. And uh, at the very least, that will help you, uh, I hope that will help you ask 
pertinent questions that you'll need to consider uh, as you go forward through the uh, rest of the series. So once upon a time, I used to start this presentation by showing a map like this, where the states in blue um, were the states that had any dyslexia law, but that's become pointless over the past two years because as you can see, virtually every state in the country has some type of dyslexia law at this point, including uh, Washington, DC. So I thought a more pertinent question to start with would be, uh, what is the meaning of dyslexia from a policy perspective? And what these maps illustrate are two things. First, most states have recognized the International Dyslexia Association definition of uh, dyslexia, which Nancy read previously. Uh, and that's illustrated by the map on the left. Um, and very often they have recognized the definition uh, directly in their legislation. Uh, and if they haven't uh, recognized it in their legislation, then they've recognized it uh, either on their state education agency websites or in their um, guidance documents like a state dyslexia handbook. Um, where they uh, don't, uh, recognize uh, the International Dyslexia Association definition it is frequently, or historically is frequently because they don't have uh, any law that has changed over the past uh, couple of years. Um, and on the right, we have a map that illustrates states that also recognize state specific definitions. And um, one of the sort of confusing things about definitions is you may notice that there are some overlap in these states. So these are not mutually exclusive categories. Um, states sometimes will mention both definitions in a single document. And when they do this, they typically don't say something along the lines that you know, the IDA definition takes precedence over all other definitions in use. Um, the sort of different ways they go about um, identifying these uh, definitions. And so uh, when I created these maps through policy studies over the past couple of years, we had to take a very broad approach to looking at recognition. So really any mention of a definition um, counted as recognition of a de definition. Um, in the states that have their own specific definitions, typically their definitions are very similar to the IDA definition that we've seen. It tends to simply have uh, fewer inclusionary and exclusionary criteria. In other words, they're just shorter. Um, oftentimes one gets the impression that the definition is supposed to be consistent with the IDA or NICHD definition, but there are a few instances where there are important substantive differences. Uh, Louisiana, for example, has a uh, uh, definition of dyslexia with uh, different exclusionary and inclusionary criteria, and those differences would be relevant for school practice. Uh, and so this is the IDA definition of dyslexia that is recognized by most states. I'm not going to read it again. Uh, what I want to emphasize is that the definition includes inclusionary and exclusionary criteria that need to be operationalized by school systems or anyone else aiming to use it. For instance, the definition includes students with difficulties with accurate or fluent word recognition, or spelling and decoding. It leaves open to users how to operationalize those difficulties, which makes some sense uh, given that this is typically done through the use of cut scores on an assessment and different assessments are gonna have different technical properties requiring the use of different cut scores. Um, but these criteria do make it uh, clear what we're supposed to be looking for in a school setting. The definition also has exclusionary criteria. For example, it specifies that the difficulties typically result from a deficit in the phonological component of language, and that it's often unexpected in relation to other cognitive abilities and defective classroom instruction. And so those could be considered exclusionary criteria. So we wouldn't say that a child has dyslexia uh, if they have poor spelling and decoding because they haven't been provided effective classroom instruction because they may just not had enough practice yet. Uh, and I'm noting this because states that do not use this definition uh, typically have just a foreshortened version of this definition. Um, and they may or may not see classroom instruction as a potential confound, but we think it's an important one. <clears throat> 
Yeah, Brian, Kim? Just a question for you. So um, on the map that you were showing, it appears as though Michigan has a dyslexia law, which, which isn't necessarily the case, but I know there are some nuances to how you go about shading in states. Can you explain that nuance for us? Yeah, sorry. So Michigan actually created quite a few problems uh, for me in creating this map, uh, Michigan and Colorado. So let me back up a little bit and talk about the, the origins of the study. So I started uh, analyzing dyslexia policy in 2017. And when we initially collected dyslexia legislation, um, we had a pretty simple procedure. If the law mentioned dyslexia in the K-12 process, it got coded as dyslexia legislation. And then we started analyzing it to look for common components. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about what components emerged um, but as long as they appeared in five more states, we identified the component and um, that allowed us to describe nationally what seems to be happening in terms of dyslexia legislation. Um, at some point in between the first study and the second study, we realized there are states that are, had policies that were extremely similar uh, to what the dyslexia legislation was advocating. Like there were laws on the book that already addressed screening to some extent, intervention to some extent, use of RTI or MTSS or something like this, not necessarily dyslexia specific. And so there were a few cases and Michigan was one of them where it was, we had a, we didn't want to leave it off the map because then it was going to look like there's no screening requirement or intervention requirement, which is not necessarily the case, it just wasn't dyslexia specific. Uh, and so um, we made the call that we'd make exceptions for those two states. Um, and uh, that, that was the compromise we had to make uh, due to technical limitations. If we wanted it to appear on the map at all, that's just kind of what we had to do. So you also see that discrepancy here versus uh, any published articles. Uh, they don't identify these states as having dyslexia legislation. Thank you for that clarification, Brian. I know that it does appear two times in our school aid finance law, so in section 35D and 35A. So I believe that that's probably the problem that we're we're creating for you to shade in yeah. our our state. Yeah, but that's okay. If, you know, one or two I can handle. If it was more complicated, I'm not sure what I would do. But I'd go back to the drawing boards. <laughs> Yeah, and so I mentioned in that first study that um, we looked for the most predominant trends that were emerging in um, the dyslexia policy. And uh, one of the reasons we did this is, you know, we know that there were advocacy groups out there that were advocating for a particular agenda with common features across legislative templates. Um, but that doesn't mean that's what's actually getting passed into law. So we wanted to look on the back end, what is actually getting through and affecting policy. And so uh, what we found was that. Um, the most common components of dyslexia policy included universal screening, intervention, uh, pre-service professional development, and in-service professional development, and to a somewhat lesser extent, uh, RTI and MTSS. Um, and what we can see on the map is, uh, for all of the maps, the states that are in light blue are the states that have that particular policy component requirement. And the states that are in dark blue are states that have uh, any legislation that mentioned dyslexia at all. Um, yeah, so I'll let people take a, a look at that. Um, a couple other sort of trends that we've noticed is that states that require universal screening typically require intervention now. That was not the case when we first started. When we first started, there were more states that required screening, but they didn't necessarily require intervention. And we're glad to see that they're actually doing something with their data now. Um, other trends we've noticed is that a lot of states will promote screening and intervention without having uh, an explicit requirement. Uh, so California would be an example of that. Both are promoted, but uh, schools are not actually required to collect that data or to intervene based on the data. So when states require universal screening, what are they actually doing? Uh, in a follow-up study, we went back to the five policy components that we had identified and then went back through the legislation to try to pull them apart. 
one of the limitations of the previous study was that if a state required screening or intervention, uh, we noticed there, there were lots of different ways that they were going about um, I guess making these requirements, for lack of a better word, but what the requirements consisted of varied quite a bit. So in, for screening, most states require screening in K through three, but quite a number also require screening just for K2. Uh, I think seven or eight, it's K1. And then there's even uh, one or two states that require screening just kindergarten. Uh, New Jersey, I believe, has a screening requirement by grade two. And so it's not really clear what grade levels are being screened before then, if any, if, or if they're just waiting till uh, second grade. Um, multiple screenings per year tend to be at least encouraged in policy documents. I'm not sure that they're required, however. Um, a lot of the legislation also makes clear that screening does not result in identification or diagnosis. Uh, however, as I'll talk about, uh, they also tend to be a little ambiguous in terms of what it does result in. Um, one other aspect to this policy that I noticed but wasn't able to study because there wasn't enough commonality across states is that a number of states make types of exemptions for screening data. Uh, for example, a state law might specify that students who've already been screened by another district, let's say because they changed schools, they don't need to be screened again. Uh, I know at least one state indicates that English learners do not need to be screened. Uh, and those are obviously two very different groups, right? Because you might be concerned that there's an equity issue there. Um, will English learners get access to a test that's appropriate to their language or not? Uh, that's not really clear. And there are at least some states with exemptions that are just sort of ambiguous. It's clear that uh, their exemptions exist, but they don't really say what those exemptions are. And Brian, we have a question, I think, related to a previous slide you were on, asking yeah. if there's any requirements for professional development for practicing teachers, so in-service teachers. Yes. Um, oh, you know what? I may have. Yes. So um, there are pre-service right. and in-service requirements. I can talk a little bit about both. So in-service requirements, I would not fine-grain code these in the second study, but I can say Anecdotally, it seemed a lot of one-shot professional development events. So um, there would be one event that the state education agency would be tasked with providing. It looked like these were typically going to be done in like one to three days over the course of the year, but there was variation. There was also a couple of states where the laws indicated every year there's going to be some type of uh, training on this. So lots of, um, lots of variability in the in-service requirements. Pre-service requirements proved very difficult to study. So obviously this is one of the least popular aspects of the policy agenda, I guess you could say, because it was not as, uh, I didn't see it as much across states. Um, what we found, however, was it was very difficult to understand what was actually changing without knowing what pre-service requirements existed prior to the legislation. Uh, so the legislation would obviously say, say something like, um, in order to acquire licensure, educators must have had X number of courses on the characteristics of dyslexia and universal screening or something like that. Um, but whether or not that was much of a change from what existed before was kind of ambiguous to us. Um, Re-upping licensure requirements, sort of the same thing. So anyone who wanted to be re-licensed might have to get a training in dyslexia. Uh, um, the characteristics of dyslexia or irrelevant instruction and that sort of thing. Uh, so those are both two areas that we'd like to look at more closely, um, but there, it, it requires coding uh, another body of literature that we didn't collect in the first two studies. Thank you, Brian. This other question, it certainly could go to you and or Nancy Nelson. Um, it, are you familiar or can you talk to, speak to the um, October 2015 Dear Colleague letter? from the US Department of Education, Office of Special Education Rehabilitate, Rehabilitative Services, OSERS. Yeah, so I, I think I, and it's, I think this is a, a related to this issue of why, so it, it's absolutely accurate that IDEA, the Individual with Disabilities Education Act, acknowledges that dyslexia explicitly through a Dear Colleague letter and also in 
the actual language of the law, that dyslexia can be, um, dyslexia is a condition that falls with under a specific learning disability. And so the question is about why can we not diagnose dyslexia in school settings? And it's really that word, diagnosis. And so school, school psychologists in school settings do not, have not been authorized to diagnose conditions. We have been authorized to determine whether or not a child meets special education eligibility criteria for a particular condition as outlined in federal law. And so that's the distinction. And so we talk about identification in a school-based context not being synonymous with diagnosis that, that occurs in a medical or clinical condition using a diagnostic statistical manual. Most school psychologists are not licensed psychologists, some are, uh, but most are not and don't have that qualified expertise to be able to engage in that process. That said, that does not mean that we can't follow a process using IDEA, using school-based identification or examining the characteristics of dyslexia in a way that ensures that students get access to the services that are appropriate for them uh, in school settings in order to address their reading difficulties. That's, that's something we're well able to do within the current, uh, the, the confines of the current system. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, the, the letter is interesting from a historical context as well because a lot of this legislative reform predates the letter, but you can also find states that explicitly hearken to the letter as a, a catalyst for making change. I think Tennessee is an example um, where they reference the letter as the reason for undertaking some of the reforms. Thank you. Um, and in terms of what states are screening for, I'll talk a little bit about that next. Um, so the most common skills that are required targets of universal screening are phonological and phonemic awareness, coding, RAN, and uh, phonics or letter sound knowledge and alphabet knowledge. Uh, some of the least common are nonsense word repetition, written expression, comprehension and family history. Um, one important caveat I want to note about trying to give uh, counts of target requirements is that it is very difficult to code these things because there is no taxonomy of reading related constructs that researchers agree upon. And some constructs are clearly hierarchically related if not overlapping with the same thing depending on who you ask. Uh, for example, um, you know, we could say that sight word reading is a type of word reading, uh, decoding nonsense word reading, and phonics are clearly trying to get at the same thing, but whether or not you consider these distinct constructs or not is uh, open for debate, at least in some circles. So what I tried to do in um, getting counts of constructs was to provide a plausible minimum and maximum number of constructs across states. And so uh, what I found is you could say that uh, at the minimum end, there are at least eight different things that are being screened for across states. Um, or if you take an expansive view, you could say as many as 23. I wouldn't actually go with either number. I'd say it's somewhere closer in the middle, but um, I just want to point out that states are not screening for exactly the same things uh, across the states. Uh, we also looked at variation in intervention requirements across the states. And one way is that states differ is whether intervention is required to be evidence-based. I was interested in this requirement, not just because it sounds like a good thing to be evidence-based, but because the Every Student Succeeds Act promotes a particular definition of evidence-based. And I was curious about its alignment with uh, state policy in the area of reading. So I think just over a dozen states require the use of evidence-based interventions, but uh, interestingly, they don't, they don't all use the ESSA definition. I would say most, well, I, I'm not even sure that most do. Some use the ESSA definition, many don't define it at all, and uh, at least a couple have their own definition that may or may not be consistent with the ESSA definition. Uh, and on this particular map, this does not include states that um, 
require or promote the use of scientifically based or research based practices. We're looking specifically at evidence based uh, because of the potential alignment issue. A um, couple other ways that states vary in terms of intervention. Um, explicit instruction was another common intervention component that we looked at. Um, along with explicit instruction, states frequently called for the use of structured literacy, but we didn't code that separately because there isn't as a developed a, a, a literature, literature base for structured literacy. And I believe that every state that mentions stu structured literacy in the requirement also had an explicit or direct instruction. So it just became kind of redundant, even though they're not the same thing. Uh, we also looked at states that required the use of intervention in an MTSS or ITI framework. And you can see that in the top right corner. Again, just over a dozen states or so uh, with that requirement. Uh, I'll point out that this is specifically the use of MTS or RTI within the context of dyslexia legislation. We know that other states were probably using these things for more general requirements that I'll get to in a minute, but um, MTSS and RTI um, are obviously applicable to the identification of disabilities. And so it may have been the case that some states did not mention the use of MTSS or RTI because it would, would have been redundant since it was already state policy. It's just not dyslexia specific. Uh, then we also looked at states that were using multisensory instruction. Uh, as Nancy mentioned, the evidence in favor of multisensory instruction is uh, not as strong as, say, explicit or direct instruction, but we were still curious about um, how commonly it was used. And so you can see that uh, in the lower right. Okay, so without exception, the dyslexia screening legislation indicated that screening can result in a classification of risk as opposed to a diagnosis or identification of disabilities. However, I was still curious about the extent to which states had clear processes through which screening would inform identification. And it turns out most state laws did not address this issue, though a few did. Uh, typically, the impression you're apt to get from reading a common dyslexia law is that screening data should be incorporated into whatever the pre-existing process for identifying disabilities was. And so to fully understand the state of dyslexia screening and intervention, I actually had to reach back to some older research on how disabilities are identified across the states generally. Uh, and so the coloring on this map may be a little dated. I think the study was from 2015 and we just had to use the classifications that they came up with. Uh, but they illustrate some of the complexity we've already been talking about uh, and why it's very difficult to uh, generalize about dyslexia identification uh, or specific reading disabilities. So right off the bat, we can see there are two main approaches used in the identification of eligibility for special education services. There's the severe discrepancy model, which is the top map, SD. And that considers whether a student's academic achievement is commensurate with his or her intellectual ability. And is the response to intervention model, which IDA defines as a process based on the child's response to scientific research based intervention. And technically, there's a third model as well called patterns of strength and weaknesses, but very few states use that. So uh, we didn't uh, include, um, we didn't make a whole map for that. Uh, and within those two broad approaches, states have taken different approaches to policy actions. They might require one by law, they might prohibit one by law, or they may indirectly uh, require or promote one through guidelines. So at the end of the day, there were something like 23 different combinations that you could come up with in order to describe a state's approach to identifying disabilities. Uh, and all that's to say that there is a lot of variation within states in terms of how disabilities get identified. And so that's, you know, when, when you hear us talking about what you should be doing with screening in terms of identification, uh, we're, we're not trying to dodge the question. It's, there are pre-existing processes for how identification is supposed to occur. And um, as people who work at the national level to say, you know, you do this with screening data would be totally irresponsible because there's so much on the ground variation. Um, it's, well, yeah, that's pretty much, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Um, Ryan, there, 
There was another question that came in, uh, someone double checking for understanding, essentially what is diagnosed as a specific learning disability in reading in the school that will overlap with a diagnosis of dyslexia? So as Nancy was saying, there really you're identifying eligibility for special education services um, and we're not making a, a diagnosis and states have different processes through which they make these decisions. Um, and it, you know, it makes some sense that dyslexia legislation isn't going to try to revamp the entire special education system on a state by state level, um, but it does make it harder to um, generalize about what is happening with screening data. What the laws generally do is give some acknowledgement that the screening data is supposed to lead to future assessment. Sometimes they'll say specifically a diagnostic assessment or a comprehensive evaluation. Um, but generally, it's just sort of implied that you're going to get this data and it's relevant to the process that's already in place. There are exceptions. Um, Louisiana spells out from start to finish how screening data leads to identification, for instance. Um, but that's, yeah, uh, does, does that answer the question? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I can I can also comment on that too. Again, just so I think um, it, it's true generally that if we're talking about identification in school settings, the the way that uh, we look at procedures for identification for SLD as the umbrella category and reading as the particular difficulty, it it's not really it doesn't really matter. If, it could be a comprehension difficulty that determines that the child is eligible for special education under IDEA. So it would fall under that SLD umbrella uh, with a focus in reading, or it could be a word level reading difficulty that gets them there. So they're not one and the same, they're different, but it would all fit under that large umbrella of SLD, smaller umbrella of reading difficulties, and more specifically either dyslexia or other difficulties that could be contributing to these reading difficulties. Um, there's a very helpful um, sort of table that understood.org has put out around clinical diagnosis based versus school-based identification. And I can provide the, the link or, sh or share that, um, but it's, it's really useful, I think, for thinking about this terminology and how we in schools are identifying students and determining eligibility versus diagnosing a condition. We know that there are plenty of kids who come to school with a diagnosed disability who don't qualify for special education. They'll never never be identified in a school context because that's not what our special education law allows us to do. Sorry, Brian. <laughs> yeah, no, no uh, that's, that's helpful. Um, and what I have on this screen may help clarify a ways that you can do some of what Nancy was talking about, but also be why it's difficult for us to generalize about what states are doing. So this is a figure from Texas's dyslexia handbook, and it, this outlines the process that that state is supposed to be using um, for identifying disabilities. So you give a universal screening for reading uh, and dyslexia, if the student shows low risk for reading difficulties, they continue to get evidence-based core reading instruction or tier one on the left. And then you just keep um, ongoing monitoring to observe for reading difficulties and or characteristics of dyslexia and related disorders. Presumably if they start showing more characteristics, then maybe you switch over to uh, either more screening or more uh, diagnostic assessment. Uh, if the student may be at risk for reading difficulties, then you're going to collect and review quantitative and qualitative data on the student. And then you can do one of two things. Uh, analysis of screening results show that student exhibits reading difficulties that are not consistent with characteristics of dyslexia and related disorder. You're going to begin or continue academic interventions or determine if an evaluation under IDEA or Section 504 is warranted. Uh, or if the um, Uh, if the analysis of the screening results and data show that the student does exhibit characteristics of dyslexia and related disorders, then you begin the evaluation process. Um, and they actually give on the following pages a breakdown of what the 504 and evaluation process should consist of. 
Um, I didn't show it here because they also emphasize that these are supposed to be individualized evaluations as well, though. So when you're looking at rule out factors like language, uh, lack of English proficiency, I should say, um, you know, you need to take these things into account, but the exact combination of measures and data points you're going to use to make a decision is idiosyncratic. And so, um, you know, as much as I like to say from a methodological perspective, like this is exactly what you do with your data, uh, that's not something that state policies are really doing right now. So it's hard for us to be more specific than that. Okay, so I wanna pause here and recap what we've seen so far. So first there are broad across state similarities in terms of dyslexia policy. Uh, it makes sense to talk about screening, intervention, and professional development as common focal points of dyslexia legislation and policy. However, those broad trends mask a lot of heterogeneity in terms of uh, what those components consist of. States are screening uh, at overlapping but different times in terms of grade level, and they're screening for overlapping but different skills. They're intervening in different ways with different levels of intensity. Uh, and it isn't always clear how screening and intervention are supposed to connect with identification. And again, I'm pointing this out because I'm frequently asked to give my opinion about um, state, state policies and what do I think the effects of the law are going to be or what is a good policy component, but it's really difficult to uh, make these sort of determinations. And uh, I always dodge the questions and it's not just I mean, I have lots of reasons for not wanting to answer the questions, but just looking at the variation across states, it's really difficult uh, to make any sort of professional judgments. Um, and if it were a simple matter of moving from a condition of where states are adopting these laws and going from a condition where nobody was screened and there was no intervention happening to one where everyone gets screened and intervention happens for every kid that needs it, I might be a little more bold in making predictions, but we also know that's not what's happening, right? We're comparing conditions of it was sort of occurring before, and we're hoping these laws are going to improve the implementation of these things and make them more regular and uh, more prevalent. Uh, and so again, when you're comparing those two conditions, it's hard to tell whether a law is gonna make an impact. Uh, and so, that's the national context. My understanding is that Michigan is considering a bill, Senate Bill 1173. Uh, and I'll just reiterate why I think it's so difficult to uh, make predictions about uh, the, the effects of the law. So my understanding is that this bill will promote, among other things, universal screening K through three. It will provide for intervention, the use of MTSS, uh, progress monitoring, which is, uh, we're starting to see more of across the states, but it didn't emerge as one of the predominant across state trends uh, back in 2017. The use of explicit instruction, professional development, and the creation of the dyslexia guide, which again, I think is now pretty common across the states, but it wasn't when we started. So I'd say the law compared to other states is very comprehensive in terms of all the different components that it addresses. Uh, that said, like I mentioned, uh, you know, when Kim asked why Michigan was already coded as a, a state that had dyslexia legislation, well, we know some of this stuff has been going on. I mean, you know, Kim works at the MTSS Center. Um, this is happening to some degree, and so it's just hard to know um, what effects the laws are going to have when we're moving from a, a condition of, let's say, imperfect implementation, for lack of a better word, to uh, more intensive impl implementation or something like that. Ryan, I know that Michigan's um, dyslexia bill package has screening up through eighth grade. And so I'm curious if other states have tackled screening beyond third grade as well. Sort of. So we only looked at re requirements, but there are other states that hedge their bets a lots of different ways in their policy documents. So definitely other states will say things like, if screening is necessary, continue to screen up through eighth grade. Um, requirement wise tends to be at the other end. And um, like I mentioned, I think the requirements also tend to only call for screening once per year, which, you know, a I'm not sure why you would want a second data point to know uh, if your policies are working, but um, I, I get the sense that they are 
doing more than is required in a lot of cases. But K through eight is, um, if it, I don't re recollect if in the Senate bill it's required K through eight, that would be more than uh, I've typically seen. Thank you. Okay, so now that I've kind of put you in my shoes as a researcher who has to make sense of everything that's going on across the country in terms of dyslexia legislation, I wanna pivot a little bit and talk about um, some of the variables that we've been talking about in terms of policy and think about how they relate to estimates of dyslexia prevalence. And um, again, the inability of researchers to say, we want everyone to do exactly this with your data. Uh, not that that would be a universally celebrated possibility, even in ideal conditions. Uh, so you've, you've probably heard varying estimates for the prevalence of dyslexia ranging from something like four to five percent to up to nearly 20 percent. And you're probably asking what is going on. I mean, how can the estimates be so different? You know, four to five percent is a small difference. Five to 20 percent is a huge difference. Uh, and the answer is actually pretty simple. Just like different states use different definitions of dyslexia and operationalize risk in different way, ways, so do researchers. Uh, and with more, researchers introduce another variable that I've only briefly touched on, and that's cut scores. So when we're talking about dyslexia, we're looking to include kids who have difficulties in uh, the previously mentioned skills like decoding. But what's a difficulty? In, in practice, it's probably a cut score on an assessment that predicts uh, low reading achievement sometime in the future. And these scores are arbitrary in that you could probably raise the score up or down a little bit and get pretty similar prevalence estimates or results. Um, to address other aspects of dyslexia legislation, uh, excuse me, uh, to address other aspects of dyslexia's definition, researchers usually only account for one or two other measures um, rather than the whole host of inclusionary or exclusionary criteria that we saw in the NICHD definition. On the screen, for example, is an interesting plot from a study by Richard Wagner that pilot tests a new way of estimating the prevalence of dyslexia. And the data points on this plot represent uh, the deviations or differences between the listening and reading comprehension for a whole bunch of elementary school students. And the, the vertical line represents an arbitrary cut of one and a half standard deviations below the mean, where the researchers are saying kids to the left of this line have low reading achievement, right? That's arbitrary. We could adjust it up or down a little bit, um, you know, unless we're, a, at the 50% mark, I think it makes sense. To, uh, you, could, you could justify moving the line. Uh, and the diagonal line represents the discrepancy between their reading and listening comprehension, uh, which was also operationalized as one and a half standard deviations. And I like this plot because it helps illustrate the range of kids that you might say have dyslexia, including kids who might not qualify for services because they actually have better than average reading comprehension. So. If you look at the upper right quadrant, uh, the one that's the sort of dark pink, those are students who ha don't have low reading comprehension, but there's still a deviation between their listening comprehension and reading comprehension. So my guess is that there are probably people in their lives who are noticing like, hey, my kid's really struggling with reading. I don't get it. Um, you know, everything else, uh, all their other learning seems pretty easy to them. Um, but they might not qualify for services because they don't actually have low reading comprehension. And then kids to that left of the line are kids who do have a discrepancy uh, and also have uh, low reading comprehension. Um, and so with just looking at two measures, you can see that we can sort of adjust prevalence estimates a, a lot of different ways um, just using those two measures. And I haven't even addressed the measures you would need to use if you're operationalizing the IDA or NICHD definition of dyslexia, um, right? The, we'd be looking at some of the pre-reading skills as well as exclusionary factors. Uh, and so it's necessary to do this in research because there's no way we could collect all that data for all those kids and analyze all of it. We have to use simplified versions when making these prevalence estimates, uh, but there is some arbitrariness to the, the, class of, to the uh, prevalence estimates. Nancy, if I can just in, interrupt for a moment, we had a question in the chat that actually gives a nod to our to our second session, which is focusing on 
screening and inter intervening. Um, but there was a question about the types of interventions. What, what would we see, uh, what would we want to see for uh, students that demonstrate the characteristics of dyslexia? You're on mute, Nancy. Well, that won't be very helpful, will it? <clears throat> Uh, we would want to see the interventions that target these word level reading skills. And so I know I've said that multiple times, but I'll clarify a little bit more of what I mean. And so it's, it's really going to vary based on the student's uh, age and skill level, right? So we know in say kindergarten and early first grade, we might focus more on those interventions on phonemic awareness and building students foundational skills in those areas, transitioning into a focus on uh, decoding and multisyllabic decoding as kids get in for first grade, second grade into maybe early third grade. Um, in conjunction with other reading skills that students should be taught, but the intervention should re really be targeted to those skills that we know are the best predictors at a particular time point of a student's reading proficiency. Similarly, and I think in the question, there was a question about uh, monitoring and what skills you should be progress monitoring for kids that are receiving intervention. And my answer is always that you don't assess unless you have a reason to assess. So you're not just going to use a sort of universal progress monitoring assessment for children who are getting intervention. You want the, assess the progress monitoring assessments that you're using to be targeted toward the skills they're being taught. The goal of that assessment is to monitor whether or not they're learning the skills you're teaching them. And so you want that assessment and, and their intervention to be aligned. Thank you, Nancy. Do you, I, I know we only have about 11 minutes left and I'm wondering if there is a way to kind of, kind of tie up some of the higher level pieces that we were hitting on around the simple view of reading, MTSS and characteristics of dyslexia. Yeah, I think one point and just looking at this um, is the scatter plot that Brian's sharing is that this is this is really taking into account this the simple view of reading. And so you know the the take home message here is that we see students who are struggling with various different skills and whether or not those children have dyslexia is largely left up to sort of an arbitrary cutoff that is set. We, there's not clear consensus in the field about what that cutoff should be on each individual assessment or skill in order to determine that a child actually has dyslexia. And so in those cases, we're looking for sort of, we're looking at this continuum of severity. We're looking at these multiple markers or characteristics. And then ultimately we're using our school system to provide instruction and intervention where we're, we're, we're relying on multi-tiered systems of support or response to intervention to determine early risk and provide evidence-based explicit systematic instruction and intervention to kids. We have to make sure that it's good, that we measure implementation to make sure it's high quality, that we provide students with those interventions and we monitor their progress over time. So all of those things are necessary and stem from what Brian is talking about related to legislation and policy and how we're identifying students ultimately. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of complex moving parts clearly you know, in all of this. This is a bit of a, this session tonight is a bit of a, an overview of what dyslexia is and what it looks like in the legislative landscape so that you know what, what other states are doing and how well your own state is aligned with what those other states are doing. But we're going to move toward additional sessions focused on these issues of identification, uh, on screening and, and instruction and intervention uh, and working with families and schools together to support students with or at risk for dyslexia. Thank you. There was a question about what, what is RAN? What is RAN? Oh, Ryan can answer that for me. <laughs> yeah, rapid advertised naming. So the basically it, diff, different RAN measures look a little different, but it's uh, basically naming, I think it's typically colors um, as, as quickly as, <laughs> as rapidly uh, as the name implies. Um, and it has, it's, it's used basically as a, I guess you could say as like a rule out uh, criteria and to sort of get at processing speed um, in students. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that is great. And so, and what we see often, there's like four different measures that can be used. Colors, objects, letters, and numbers are the most common ones. Um, the comprehensive test of phonological processing is a widely used measure, ha includes a widely used measure of RAND. Um, and in kindergarten, there's more of a focus on 
objects and colors, which are contexts that should be well known to students so that you're actually measuring processing speed instead of their knowledge of what those things are. Letters and numbers can be a, can be a little bit confounded early on, but we can move toward using letters and numbers over time as a, as a proxy for rapid automate, automatized naming, which is um, essentially a measure of processing speed. Thank you. Um, so uh, a, a question just came in. Shouldn't we begin to train teachers in the science of reading? Yes, please. <laughs> um, I, and I'm saying, you know, as a as a former educator, I am I am saying, um, you know, there's there is not enough emphasis on teaching the science of reading, which is the body of knowledge that we've developed to date about how reading develops and how reading can be taught. Um, it, that body of knowledge is emerging, but it's true that there is a um, sort of a, a disconnect uh, often between teacher training programs and the science of reading that we'd, we'd like to address. Thank you. We do have a, a comment. RAN assessments also involve assessments like the CTOP2 and the WISC-5 um, also has an assessment that will do that. Do you have any, any comments on that? Yep, no, that's, yep, there, are, there are multiple measures of RAN. This, the CTOP, as, uh, as noted, is a, high, a widely used measure. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you. So I think in sort of wrapping things up there, um, there are two last things. Brian has a next slide that shows an, an infra infographic sharing. And I'll, Brian, you can speak to this and then I'll, I'll, um, I'll do the last two. Yeah, just very quickly, uh, I did want to sort of put an equity lens on the policy landscape as well and just sort of point out that there is research suggesting that um, there, there may be some equity issues when it comes to dyslexia classification. Tim Odegaard recently published a study that found that uh, dyslexia classification was less likely for minority students and individuals in schools with a higher percentage of minority students. Uh, and so the definitions we looked at obviously did not mention race, ethnicity, or SES. And so um, it is important that we're making screening and intervention uh, accessible to all students. Great. And those resources, uh, like the infographic Brian shared, are available on our web website, www.improvingliteracy.org. So at, at in closing, I want to revisit our questions. We had some um, high um, results the first time around, but I want, I want you to go back through these questions based on what we have discussed today and acknowledge your responses again, true or false for each of these uh, five questions or five statements. Take about a minute to do that, please. All right, and I think our results are popping up here. And so we've got a lot, a lot of falses all the way across. There's, uh, uh, in general, uh, the, the results match uh, the content that we've, we've shared today around uh, these myths and, and what, is, what is false based on what we know um, in research and uh, our, our evidence for best practice. <clears throat> Uh, there is before as we're closing out. I'm, I'm sure Kim may have some closing comments. It looks like maybe there is there's another uh, question about evidence based materials and getting access to what materials might be evidence based. And I, my recommendation would be a couple of uh, sources that collate evidence based materials. So uh, the National Center on Improving Literacy has a resource repository where we have 
uh, gone through and sort of digested what is available uh, across the um, US or internationally in the area of research and uh, determine whether or not those are high, high quality tools and resources. And you can, it's a completely searchable uh, repository. So I, I recommend that as sort of a, a general way of getting access to uh, evidence based information. If you're looking specifically for instruction and intervention materials, or intervention materials, I should say, uh, the National Center on Intensive Intervention reviews academic interventions based on research studies that have been conducted and identifies those that have uh, research evidence. So the good studies have been conducted and they tell you what level of evidence is available for particular programs. The What Works Clearinghouse, which is available through the Institute of Education Sciences, is another excellent resource for documenting evidence-based programs. And Evidence for ESSA is another website um, that it serves to collate uh, evidence-based instructional programs so that educators have resources for, for selecting such programs. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Kim uh, to make some any closing remarks she'd like to make. And then we have a last slide that is a link to the session evaluation. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nancy and Brian, for your presentation. Our next session is on March 16th, and it is focused on early identification and intervention supports for students with characteristics of dyslexia. So that last question, Nancy, that you ended with was a good, good segue um, preparing us for March 16th. So with that said, I, we really thank everyone for, the, for participating. I know that it's a late evening. Um, and Nancy, do you wanna advance the slide or Brian and we can make sure people have the link to the evaluation. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks everyone.